Well, comics and comic artists have finally begun to get their due. Once a target of anxious parents and teachers, comic books have shrugged off the stigma that relegated them to the same cultural corner as junk food, hockey cards, and miniature action figures. Many comics are now being hailed for rich, culturally relevant storytelling suitable for adults and children. And in terms of Canada's comic book culture, Seth, a.k.a. Gregory Gallant, is one of our most celebrated talents. The Guelph, Ontario resident is a world-renowned an award-winning comic artist and writer. His work includes the comic book series Palookaville, the graphic novels It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, Wimbledon Green, and the recently published George Sprott, 1894 to 1975, which was serialized in the New York Times magazine. Seth is also a critically acclaimed book designer and comic historian whose latest project is the lovingly produced hardcover book The Collected Doug Wright, Canada's master cartoonist, the first of a two-volume series celebrating one of Canada's Canada's neglected comic legends, and I'm pleased to welcome Seth to Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello. You look as ever immaculate. Thank you very much. <laughs> you look very, and straight out of 1946, in, 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 uh, immaculate. Well, almost. I mean, I think about 10 years ago, I was out of 1946 with the right suits, but this is probably about 1986. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, well, in a good way. You're, you look good. Uh, I want to talk about your own work, but I, I want to start off talking about Doug Wright, because this is someone that... I didn't necessarily know about until your book, and it's been such a discovery. And it is, it is. I called the book spectacular earlier. I mean, it's huge to describe it, and and it really does feel spectacular as one wades through it. This Doug Wright collection, you you designed and co-edited with writer Brad McKay. Who was Doug Wright? Well, Doug Wright was a um, you know back in the uh, the majority of the 20th century in in Canada, um, cartoonists were commercial artists. And in Canada, there really were only a handful of top-notch commercial cartoonists that worked in the Canadian market. I mean, it was a small market, so there was a small number of guys working there. And surprisingly, in that small number, there really are some great cartoonists, and Doug Wright was one of them. Um, Doug, he worked in um, the Canadian magazine and the Weekend magazine for about 40 years. And he produced a domestic strip, which was called Nipper, and later called Doug's Wright, Doug Wright's Family. And, um, you know, on first glance, someone might look at it and think, you know, oh, this looks like the family circus or something. Right. But uh, it's really not like that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think what's great about Doug's work is uh, there's a couple of things. One is the work is incredibly rich in the visuals. He was a great master draftsman. And um, when you look at these strips, the one thing that will immediately strike you as you work your way through them is just um, how much they capture a time and a place. And when you look at them, you're like, if you're my age, I'm in my mid-40s, you'll see like those strips from the late 60s or the early 70s, and you'll be like, this is, I remember this period. Mm. This is just what it looked like. You'll see the screen doors, the cars, the furniture, everything. It's really like a wonderful document of the times. And what's really interesting is it's a real document of Canada, which is unusual. Um, and there's well, an unusual- Let me get to all uh, that. Sure. Uh, let me ask you first, when did you discover Doug Wright? I mean, you're still relatively yeah. young. So did, did you, do you actually I remember him as a him kid? As a kid? Yeah, okay. I read him as a kid. I remember he came in the weekend uh, supplement newspaper magazine, which was, I think, a uh, weekend at that point. And my mom really liked the strip, and I used to read it. And, um, and then I forgot about it. You know, this is typical when you hit your teen years. You know, a lot of this stuff falls away that you liked when you were a kid. And I rediscovered his work in the 80s, actually. I was in a junk shop. Hmm. And I picked up a couple of old magazines because I'm a big collector type. And I saw the work and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this stuff, Doug Wright. And I thought, this looks better than I remembered, actually. And so then I began a process of hunting out his work, which was a long, a decade's worth of pursuing his art. And, and, Nip and just seeing how great it was. Nipper is such a, reading through your book and seeing all these, old, he's such a compelling little character. I mean, he's like mm -hmm. our own Charlie Brown. Yeah, exactly. He's really, in the first 10 years, he really is closer maybe to a little Dennis the Menace. He's a bit of a right. brat. In right. fact, those first 10 years, I probably wouldn't have been as excited about the strip if that's all that he had done. Because even though it's visually very exciting, it's the work as it goes on after he has his own children and... Um, the later work through the 60s and 70s that's most interesting because then the strip takes on a strange, almost not a gag format. There's still a laugh or a chuckle at the end of the strips, but what's interesting about them is they take on a very small, they're very slight incidents, each of the strips, and you do get a feeling that he's drawing from his own life. And that adds like, um, because these guys were commercial artists, they weren't trying to produce art with a capital A. They were trying to make entertainment. But, you know, when you see this kind of work that's done by an individual, often a lot of their own life creeps into it. 
And I think that's what's interesting about Doug's work is that the strips are very small incidents. They're little things between him and the children or between the children themselves. And they're very unsentimental, which is what's nice about it. You say it's exceedingly Canadian. Mm -hmm. How so? It really is. I mean, I don't think Doug was setting out to create a Canadian strip, but it's just the sheer fact that it's set in Canada during this period and that he really does... um, focus on regular life and shows the details that make it remarkably Canadian. I think any Canadian would open it up and just immediately like be pleased to see their own country re- reflected back at mm. them in that way, in a way that's not forced, just very natural, like there's Canada, there's those suburbs. Seth, why do you think Doug Wright's work fell into relative obscurity, where similar American artists, uh, such as uh, Peanuts creator Charles M. Schultz, who you're familiar with, you've done this, this, uh, you've been the designer of this 25 volume series, The Complete uh, Peanuts. Uh, he remains quite popular still. Mm-hmm. What, what what happened to the the Doug Wrights of the world, or or Doug Wright for that matter, yeah. as a Canadian? Well, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, probably the first is just simply that. There was real no machine behind Doug's work in the same way there was behind Charles Schultz's work. I mean, Schultz was like a marketing giant. Um, Sometime in the 70s, he started marketing peanuts. And, I mean, you you know, Schultz was one of the richest men in the world. Uh, Even now, 10 years after he's dead, or or maybe six years after he's dead, he's still one of the top earners in in, uh, entertainment. And I think, you know, it's the multimedia aspect of Peanuts that's really, like, kept it alive more than anything. I mean, those those specials are on TV every year, and there's you can find all the stuffed Snoopies you want. But um, Doug's work was never marketed like that. It exclusively appeared just as a comic strip. And when he died, uh, the strip disappeared from the paper, and people stopped thinking about it. Uh, the flip side of that, I think, is just that Canadians don't really... Uh, they're not good at celebrating their own things. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, and if I do think that like, even while he was popular in Canada, I think there was some sense that if it's in Canada, it must be second rate. And uh, the funny thing is, is it really wasn't second rate. But I do think that we have a strong feeling about that. We don't look back at our own stuff, as, unless it's like really obvious work to look back at. I, I want to ask you about this other book now, this uh, George Sprott, um, mm-hmm. the great Montreal publisher, Drawn and Quarterly, has just published George Sprott, 1894 to 1975. That's the name of it. A work of yours which had been serialized in the New York Times magazine. Uh, and it's about the life of an elderly television host who revels in the Arctic adventures of his youth. I, I'm so consumed in this. I, I, I think, <laughs> I, and George Sprott, I'm just like, I, 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 I'm really involved in this character. What caught your imagination about such a character? Where did he come from? Well, you know, I think he really came from the fact that in the last few years I'd been thinking a lot about all the television I watched as a kid. And uh, I grew up in around Windsor, and I saw a lot of Canadian TV and a lot of American TV because Detroit was just across the river. And um, there was a lot of local television in that time, and you got kind of interesting characters through local television. And I just think it just percolated up to the surface. There was a few figures that kind of were the basis of, you know, where I start from George Sprott, um, just from people, you know, kind of, People you don't see on TV anymore, specifically old fat men, you know, (laughs) reminiscing about their youth in the 1940s and 50s. So uh, it just naturally seemed like a topic for me. I always write about old people, and I always write about people at the end of their life. And uh, it's just, you know, where do your ideas come from? It just percolated up when the time came. These books are huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're big books. That that can't be a cost-effective way to do this, (laughs) or or a prescription for making a lot of money. Um, my, I really am the typical artist in that I have no sense of like, you know, uh, anything to do with money. And so what it really comes down to is I just ask the publisher, can I make this as big as I want? Can I use shiny foil on the cover? Whatever it is. And good if he says you. yes, I do it. You've got a good publisher. Uh, mu- much has been made of, uh, about your love of all things past. And I, I made the joke about you looking like 1946. And I, I mean that in a good way. Your personal style, your decor, your work often deals with the 20th century past and fictional histories too. Some critics have understandably labeled you a nostalgia. Nostalgist. Mm-hmm. Does that term resonate with you? Yeah, it irritates me. I really dislike the term nostalgist. Uh, I, I just like the term nostalgia in general. I certainly understand why it's applied to me. Um, I think it's, it's somewhat fair. Um, I am uh, very much living in the past. My work is almost entirely about the past. But nostalgia has a really unpleasant quality to it, the, the word. Um, I think people who aren't labeled by it just think of it's just a word. You know, They say, oh, yes, yeah, nostalgia, thinking about the past. But when you see it pop up in everything, any article ever written about you, you realize that the word nostalgia actually has like a pejorative quality to it. How so? 
Well, it tends to imply looking back with a certain kind of sickly sentiment. Misty-eyed. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think my work is about looking back, and it is about people going over their own lives. I don't really think it's about longing for a golden age. Uh, the one book I did do with myself as the character where I'm looking back and kind of, uh, you know, with uh, golden haze of the past, I make it a point to really clearly show that I'm confused and that I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what I really think of this time period because I do want the audience to understand that I'm looking back at this period but not seeing it as some sort of, you know, beautiful golden age. I'm very fascinated with the early part of the 20th century, but I'm certainly not stupid enough to think that, like, you know, I would want to live in 1935. It was utopian. Yeah, exactly. So, me, meaning that you, would you, I mean, that, it's a question that comes to mind. Do you feel like you were born at the wrong, at the wrong time? Would you like to be living in the thir- 1930s and 40s? No, definitely not. Um, the thing is, I think aesthetically, the, our culture probably came to its peak about 1925 to maybe 1939 or something. Um, I could probably change those dates any day of the week. But <laughs> the truth is, nobody wants, who wants to live in the middle of the Depression or in the middle of World War II? And you certainly wouldn't want to live there if you're not like a privileged white person either. Um, but I do think uh, I'm very, I do think there's been like a cultural decline is what depresses me throughout our culture. I don't feel in touch with the culture right now. But that doesn't mean that I have that, you know, self-aggrandizing feeling like, oh, I was born in the wrong time. There's something very, uh, well, that's kind of a sickening sort of uh, way to feel about things, too. Seth, it's unlikely that your work is going to fall into obscurity like that of uh, Doug Wright. You're well known in Canada internationally. It seems like it's a particularly good time to be a, a comic artist. Would you? Is it that is. true? Yes, it definitely is. There's been some sort of a cultural shift around the turn of the century where the graphic novel sort of finally burst through into the mainstream culture. Um, I'm not really sure why it happened, um, but it has been a change, and there's, um, I've felt it, for sure. Respect? Respect. Uh, the books sell better. Um, certainly, right around the, you know, the end of the last century, I, I felt that it was all coming to an end, actually. Uh, it seemed like a lot of the publishers were in trouble. The market was bad. Um, I was really sitting and thinking, like, I guess I'm going to be going back to Xeroxing things. <laughs> But then things changed. It really changed. I mean, I saw a cartoon in The New Yorker a few years ago making fun of the graphic novel, and I thought that's uh, a sign that it's been normalized. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for this. Cartoonist and illustrator Seth, he's the co-editor of a new collection of the late Canadian cartoonist Doug Wright. It's called The Collected Doug Wright, Canada's Master Cartoonist, Volume 1. And Seth has also recently published a collection of his own entitled George Sprott, 1894 to 1975. Both books are available now from Drawn and Quarterly, and Seth was with me here in Studio Q.